So I would, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to this uh, wonderful uh, congress. And uh, I'm happy that Ignacio Melero uh, was the first uh, presenter here and, uh, and uh, described, described immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors and, uh, and agonistic antibodies. And, and, uh, and, and the, the approach uh, based on immune checkpoint uh, uh, blockade uh, is, uh, is based on the idea that there are T cells around which are able to recognize the tumor and, uh, and, and, and to make this uh, T cells fit. Uh, combinations uh, aimed uh, for, the, for the idea that somehow immune responses are stimulated. Cancer vaccines have a complementary approach. Com ca uh, cancer vaccines have the approach, have the idea that we really teach the immune system about relevant tumor antigens and thereby generate this type of T cells, which can then be activated, activated by by um, by checkpoint blockade. Uh, I'm from Mainz, uh, so Mainz uh, uh, is near near Frankfurt uh, um, University City, uh, with a with a dedication for immunology. There's uh, a long tradition to do translational research uh, in my minds and from this translational research we have we have created a translational cancer center which uh, which is Tron which deals with with uh, with with the topic of 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 testing ideas developing ideas until they can be they can be uh, they can can be continued by biopharmaceutical companies and we have also biopharmaceutical companies in in mind spin offs from the university taking taking these concepts uh, bring that to patients and and ultimately aiming to get new drugs to, uh, approved uh, my group is uh, is um, is uh, 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 focusing on developing of on, on, uh, of cancer vaccines, and the platform which we are focusing on, which we are focusing on, is, is RNA vaccines. RNA vaccines have the have the have a number of advantages. For example, for example, you can take uh, take just an antigen uh, uh, and and code. And code this and code this antigen by a by a, by a template. Do in vitro transcription, and then uh, you can use the the RNA to transfect cells. And our approach is not transfecting cells, but bringing the uh, RNA directly into the body, uh, and uh, and uh, so that body uh, cells in the body can do the translation. What we did, the, the main disadvantage of using RNA is the instability of RNA. RNA is degraded in the extracellular space and it is not stable if it comes to the cells. So we, in the last 15 years, we, um, we used several approaches to improve the pharmacodynamic activity, the potency of the RNA. For example, by putting, putting novel caps which uh, inhibit the five prime uh, degradation of the RNA, but using also UTR regions allowing to increase the half-life or the translational capacity of the RNA. Moreover, we included, we included uh, modifications like, for example, uh, MHC class two targeting mo motifs, allowing us to bring the, 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 the translated protein in the cytoplasm into, into, into class two uh, presentation pathways, thereby allowing to increase, increase T cell responses. This is, this is all published and resulted in several thousand folds increase of the, of the potency of the RNA. The second aspect is which are the right cells to express the RNA. And of course, we all know that dendritic cells are cru crucial for induction of immune responses. And indeed, and indeed, indeed, um, uh, about 20 years ago, uh, for the first time, dendritic cells were, have been used uh, for for uh, antigen expression via delivery of RNA. It was. Eli, Eli, Eli Gilboa's group describing the approach uh, transfecting dendritic cells in vitro and bringing these dendritic cells back to the body. And, and actually, this, uh, this approach, this RNA-based dendritic cells transfection approach is one, one of the most powerful vaccine approaches having, having uh, uh, resulting in, in strong T-cell uh, responses in, in many, many studies. Our 
our approach is slightly different. We are not transfecting dendritic cells in vitro. We are aiming to transfect dendritic, dendritic cells directly, directly in vivo, and we have two approaches. One approach is injecting, injecting of the RNA, RNA into the lymph node by direct injection of the lymph node. And the second, appro second approach is based uh, on using uh, liposomal RNA, which is injected intravenously, and we developed liposomal approaches allowing us to, to bring the RNA into the dendritic cells in the whole body, in spleen, lymph nodes, and in the bone marrow. I will show you later data about this. Okay, starting with the starting with the intranodal approach. This is this is this is uh, from 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 mice. Uh, when RNA is injected, uh, labeled RNA is injected into mice, uh, then 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 uh, then under certain conditions, if you use buffer systems co uh, containing containing uh, uh, ions, uh, allowing to uh, to to make nanoparticles out of the RNA, the RNA is is uh, spontaneously taken up by the endothelial cells. This is lymph node, lymph node after five minutes injection of RNA. This is after 30 minutes. The whole, the whole RNA is taken up by dendritic, ce dendritic cells. It is the mechanism behind this is macropinocytosis. So uh, it is, it is a, uh, it is an active mechanism which can be, which can be blocked. For example, with macropinocytosis inhibitors gotlerine. But the nice aspect is that this, this, the dendritic cells not only take up and translate the RNA, but the RNA also by stimulating TLR, TLR re uh, receptors induce a maturation of dendritic cells as well as cytokine release. So we get a cytokine milieu in the, in the lymph node which stimulates powerful expansion of T cells. And by this, we are able to do repetitive vaccination. Since the RNA does not carry any other proteins, we can really repetitively immunize without getting vac backbone immune responses. And by repetitive vaccination, uh, we are able to get, to get, regardless which type of antigen we use, about 20, 30, 40, 50 percent of antigen-specific sp uh, T cells in the peripheral blood. This is, for example, uh, uh, an RNA uh, immunization of HLA-DR mice uh, with uh, tyrosinase uh, RNA after five vaccination cycles, 30 to 70 percent of T cells are antigen specific. This is New York ESO-1 vaccination of the same, same mice strain resulting in New York ESO-specific T cells. And uh, as mentioned, we always immunize with the full-length RNA without carrying, uh, taking care which is the right epitope for vaccination. But of course, the key question is which are the right tumor antigens for, for vaccination? And we, uh, we have now, since uh, 25 years, these questions after the first, first tumor antigens were cloned. You know the shared tumor antigens like New York ESO-1 tyrosinase, the match family members, which are not, not mutated, mutated on the other side. They are mutated tumor antigens. And we, had, we, had, we have this debate since 25 years, which are the right tumor antigens? So about six years ago, we, uh, we, uh, we, we said we want to systematically test it and want to use mutations for, for vaccination, but not only single mutation, but the entire set of mutations. The, the challenge with that is if you are interested in using the entire set of mutations, is that every patient has a different set of mutations. So that means uh, you cannot just use the shared ones, then you would just focus on five percent uh, of the mutations. If you really want to, uh, to use the entire set, you have to do, to do next generation sequencing to determine that. This is exactly what we did. So we uh, developed an approach where we started, uh, take the tumor, sequence the tumor by next generation sequencing, identified the mutations, and then we tested uh, a number of uh, algorithms to, to identify mutations which, uh, which could be immunogenic. What we, what we found is that, and that about 25 to 30 percent of mutations 
uh, randomly selected mutations are immunogenic, that most immunogenicity is driven by CD4 recognition of class two uh, ep neoepitopes and driven by CD4 T cells. And we found that if you take these mutations yeah, and predict, predict them by bioinformatic tools and put them together, multiple mutations on one cassette, we, we named this polytope vaccine approach because RNA allows you to put multiple mutations into, into one cassette and immunize mice, then you can get powerful antitumoral activity resulting in, in, uh, in clearance of established lung metastasis or established tumors. So this, this was a preclinical study uh, which we published about uh, eight months ago. And, uh, and the nice aspect about this is even though it is an individual approach, it is universally applicable to all, all, all type of tumors, not only in mice, but we can use the same approach also to treat patients. So we started a clinical trial uh, in uh, beginning 2014, addressing exactly this, can we use this approach for treatment of human cancers. We did this trial in melanoma patients, and since we, we knew that we need several months to prepare a vaccine, to do next generation sequencing, prepare the vaccine, we selected patients who are in the adjuvant stage, who do not have tumors, yeah? either being in stage three without tumors or being, being in a, in a uh, situation where a metastasis, single metastasis was removed prior, prior, prior to vaccination. So the approach works in the clinical setting as follows. So we, we get, we get um, uh, uh, peripheral blood and tumor tissue. We developed an approach which allows us to, to use um, uh, uh, paraffin embedded clinical routine biopsies the biopsies are used to extract, extract DNA from the blood and um, extract B DNA from, from the cancer sample. So we do exome, sequence, exome sequencing of both, thereby allowing us, allowing us to identify the mutations by comparison between normal and tumor. And for the identified mutations, we ask the question, uh, how, 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 how how strong are these mutations expressed in the tumor? So, so what is the expression level? And they we can do that exactly by, by not only, only looking to the mRNA itself, but to the position which is mutated so that we get really the answer, even if 80% of the tumor is contaminated with, uh, with stroma cells, we, we can define whether a mutation is expressed or, or not. And by next generation sequencing, we get a lot of more information. Uh, for, for example, combining that with bioinformatic tools, we can, we can define whether mutation will bind to MHC class 1, MHC class 2. We can define the allele frequency. We can define whether a mutation was uh, generated very early in the tumor development or is a late mutation. And we use this information and build build um, uh, bioinformatic bioinformatic algorithms, uh, uh, computerized algorithms, allowing the computer not only to identify the mutations, but also make prioritized list of, uh, of uh, mut mutations suggesting which antigens should be selected for a vaccine. Uh, and we have, a, we have a target safety monitoring board. These are five, six experts sitting together and discussing the suggestions coming from the computer. And if they are approved, we put them into, into the vaccine. And the vaccine is, is based on, on the idea that we want to get CD8 and CD4 T cell responses. So we take about uh, 27 mere with the mutation in the center. Uh, and this would allow with the mutation in the center to get every CD8 epitope and most of the CD4 T cell epitopes. And we not only just uh, take one, uh, one, uh, one mutation, but for the first clinical study, we were allowed to use 10 mutations for, for vaccination for every individual patient. We combine this, uh, this uh, uh, neo-epitopes with linkers and put them back into the pharmacologically optimized cassette. Then, then uh, the um, RNA is produced under GMP and transported to the center where it is supplied by the, by the doctor uh, by intranodal vaccination. This is the GMP production process. The GMP production it take itself takes only, only uh, two days, uh, and, but we need about three weeks to get the sterility testing done. Yeah? Uh, and, and therefore, the whole process, everything is, everything is 
complicated by regulatory requirements. If we do that in mice, we have the vaccine available after two weeks. Here in patients, we need more than three months because of all these this controls. And then if the vaccine is delivered, delivered, delivered to, the, to the clinic, it is injected by intranodal nodal injection. This is alt, uh, ultrasound guided, so this is the nodal region. And uh, I would like to ask someone to start this video. So now the needles come in. This is the lymph node. The needle comes in and then the vaccine is injected and, and it, is, it can be controlled. It's an easy, easy approach with a success rate of more than 96% in all, uh, uh, tested, tested so far. And, and you can do that repeatedly without, without getting any, any, any um, uh, changes in the, in the lymph node. So, of course, this is a first in human study. Important is safety, important is feasibility. The most important for us wa was immunogenicity. Since we did not expect to see any clinical, clinical, clinical activity since the patients are in the adjuvant stage. So we invested a lot uh, of efforts to, to, for example, do, do immune monitoring. And immune monitoring is done in a way that we get blood before vaccination, the patient, until he receives the vaccine, gets uh, vaccination with New York ESO-1 and tyrosinase. This is available directly. And when the vaccine arrives, the New York ESO-1 tyrosinase vaccination stops and the mutanome vaccination, the vaccine, vaccine with the, with the, with the neoepitope starts. And, and we get blood from different time points. Uh, and uh, if uh, for patients who are willing to continue and who tolerate the vaccine, we offer continuous vaccination. So what kind of immune responses we get? We, we have two types, two different types of immune responses. One, one is, one is, uh, one is uh, amplification of pre-existing T-cell responses. So what became clear in the last two, two years is that the success of checkpoint blo blockade mainly depends on activation of T-cells against neoantigens. This is really an exciting field now, so that, that it is now recognized that an immune response against a neoantigen could result in success of, uh, 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 of, uh, of checkpoint blockade. And indeed, if we use the samples from the patient before vaccination, we see that the patients have, for, for certain antigens, a pre-existing T-cell response. This is the pre-existing T-cell response measured with the RNA, and this is the pre-existing T-cell response measured with overlapping peptide, and you can see this is mutation number, uh, 40, uh, uh, number 47 in patient one. There is a pre-existing T-cell response, and what we see is we can amplify this pre-existing T-cell response by, by vaccination. This is the post-vaccine response, a powerful amplification of, uh, of T-cells by the vaccine. And, uh, oh, this is, so, I, I see that, okay, go back. Okay, then I will take this. So the slides are mixed, but I can I can continue with that. Uh, and um, if we do that, we can we can we can we can uh, we can uh, uh, check for every mutation uh, for in every patient whether there is a pre-existing T cell response. And so these are the mutations in patient number four. Yeah, uh, and you see uh, there are weak immune response against this mutation, weak immune response against this mutation, and, and moderate immune response against this mutation. After vaccination, this patient developed multiple, multiple mutation-specific, strong mutation-specific immune responses. And the interesting aspect is these, immu uh, these mutations are against different MHC molecules. So it's a wonderful polyclonal, polyclonal response. And this patient uh, was w was a uh, uh, this patient was a patient with uh, with uh, who developed uh, multiple metastases when waiting for the vaccine. So it allows us to see whether the patient gets an and uh, that uh, whether the uh, the immune response results in in an anti tumor response. And indeed, indeed, we have seen that the patient went from from progressive disease into stable disease and then developed a partial partial response. But but after that, the lesions remained for a long time, about eight months stable. Uh, 
So the doctors decided to take out this metastasis, metastatic lesions and analyze this metastatic lesion. This is a metastatic lesion of the patient before vaccination, and this is the metastat a metastatic lesion after vaccination, and, and the pathologist's diagnosis was uh, uh, completely necrotic metastatic lesions. But th this was not the case, because, because when we performed a vital staining, we found that still some regions of the, of the metastasis are live, have live tumor cells. So we were, we were even, even able to, to analyze, to get uh, a, a tumor cell line, melanoma cell line established. We were able to get tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and investigated that. In this, in this viable lesions, we found a strong infiltration of T cells and we found, we found also upregulation of PDL1 as uh, Ignacio Melero uh, showed. This is a sign for, for a good sign for uh, an indication for, for uh, um, responsiveness to checkpoint blockade. Everything is fine here. And now I, s I have to continue. I don't know what happened. Everything is mixed up. So uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I will go, uh, go back and forth. So this is, this is the story, continuing this, uh, the story. So we analyzed, uh, we analyzed um, the, um, the uh, um, uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and we investigated the, the blood of the patient. And what we, s what we have seen is there was, there was against this mutations, uh, mutations number five, there's no pre-existing uh, uh, T cell response in the peripheral blood. Uh, before vaccination, after vaccination, there is a pre uh, there is an established immune response, and if we analyze the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, we see that uh, that they are infiltrating the tumor, and uh, having blood from different time points allows allows us allows us to to monitor uh, how fast the immune response is generated, and you can see from this tetramere analysis that the immune uh, immune response started to be to be established after four vaccination and is robustly robust, robustly obser observed uh, about a long peri period of, of time so we induce after about 20 days um, a strong t cell response which remains active and uh, and we generate memory t cells in this patient Analyze, analyzing the phenotype of this T cells shows that uh, that the this T cells are uh, uh, at least a proportion of this T cells of antigen specific T cells are positive for PD1. So it's again a good sign that this type of treatment can be combined with uh, with checkpoint blockade. So we establish an approach allowing us not only to analyze T cells but also to get the T cell receptors out of this. Uh, T cells. Uh, it is a single T cell receptor cloning approach where we where we uh, do fax, uh, uh, single cell sorting of the T cells and then uh, perform amplification of uh, T cell receptor alpha and beta, and then we can reconstitute that and uh, and define define the specificity of the T cells. By doing this, we were able to identify T cell receptors which recognize recognizes the mutation. So we have, uh, for example, uh, identified T cell receptors recognizing mutation number 14, and we have uh, identified T cell receptors recognizing, recognizing mutation 5 in this patient. And we analyzed this, uh, this, uh, and this uh, uh, T, T cells of by transfecting that into the autologous PBMC and have seen that this, this T cells or the T cell receptors confer extremely potent cytotoxic activity with, uh, with, uh, with uh, high affinity so that, that peptide uh, could be titrated up to 10 to the minus 11. Uh, and uh, and this is, this, these are extremely potent, t uh, potent uh, T cell receptors. And since we had uh, generated a melanoma cell line in this patient. We investigated the melanoma cell line, and one of the quality controls is is to check for MHC class one and MHC class two expression. And it turned out that the melanoma cell line is negative for MHC class one. So we put interferon interferon gamma on this tumor cells, but nothing happens. And then we went back. So uh, MHC is not expressed at all. We sequenced the uh, melanoma cell line, and it turned out that both beta-2 microglobulin alleles, both, 
were deleted in this melanoma cell line. And if beta-2 microglobulin is missing, then MHC is not presented um, uh, on, 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 on the tumor cell line. So after transfecting, transfecting beta-2M into the tumor cell line, we observed upregulation of, uh, of, um, of uh, MHC class 1 presentation. And with this upregulation, we were able to see potent killing of this melanoma cell line by the T cells, which is not present if, if uh, MHC class 1 is missing. We went back to the tumor and investigated and found that indeed in the, in the tumor we have, uh, we have lost the beta-2 microglobulin expression. So this is, this is, um, this, this is, a, uh, this is an indication for, for an evolution of a tumor. Yeah? And, and, and interestingly, it is the only way to escape for this tumor because this patient had multiple T cell responses against different MHC alleles. So that beta-2 microglobulin is some sort of the, of the perfect solution for the tumor. Uh, and unfortunately, we did not have this information when we make the decision how the patient should be treated. At this time, we had no allowance to, to use combination of PD-1 and vaccine. So we said, okay, we have PD-1 positive T cells, let's go for PD-1. And under PD-1, after stopping the vaccine, the patient, patient developed multiple metastases and, uh, and within a few months died from this multiple metastasis. With this information, uh, since we know that we had also CD40 cell responses, we would perhaps favor to, to go to continue with the vaccines, hoping that at least the CD40 cell response can, can control this patient. So in the last, uh, last, uh, 15, 15, uh, uh, last five minutes, I would like to, to give you uh, also, also an, uh, an overview about, about uh, a totally novel approach. It's a liposomal vaccine. It's actually the idea, idea uh, that instead of reaching a few dendritic cells in this lymph node, gets tried to, to, to reach all dendritic cells. The idea, idea is, here, is, here, is here simple. Uh, so the immune system is evolved to deal with infectious disease particles. So if you have an infect infection just on the arm, you get a limited number of T cells because this immune system is, is dealing with econo economic considerations. So if you have a small infection, you get little uh, 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 number of T cells. If you have a systemic uh, uh, infection, of course, this is life-threatening con constellation and the immune system is activated strongly and generates a lot of T cells. For example, if you have a flu, the immune system is able to get up to 50% of antigen-specific T cells within a few days. Yeah? So the idea here is, is to simulate something which is like a systemic viral infection. For this, we, 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 uh, we, we try to identify, identify formulations allowing us after intravenous injection to bring RNA directly into, into the endotic cells. And we found that certain liposomal formulations allows us really to, to have the signal directly and the luciferase signal, which is, which is the indicator for translation, directly in the spleen, exclusively in the spleen. And if we analyze, uh, analyze the cells get, um, taking up uh, this luciferase signal, it turned out that depletion of CD11C positive cells resulted in complete loss of the signal. Yeah. So this is not only the case in the, in the, um, in the, in the spleen, but we have also trans, uh, 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 transfection of lymph node dendritic cells with depletion of dendritic cells, completely lost signal, and in dendritic cells in the bone marrow. So looking which type of cells, oh, okay, five minutes. Uh, looking which type of cells uh, express this antigen, we found that these are dendritic cells, den dendritic cells and plasmocytoid dendritic cells, and to certain aspects, macrophages. These are the expression in the lymph nodes, and uh, we have seen that the expression is extremely rapid after after one hour having already a signal. The mechanism of uptake again is macropinocytosis inhibition with uh, with uh, with rotlerin completely blocks the uptake, and uh, and it is uh, it is uh, it is just uh, skip that, uh, that uh, slide, and maturation of the dendritic cells also skips, skips the uptake. Importantly, these dendritic cells go from, from, from the, uh, are transfected in the marginal zone and, and 
and the transfection with the RNA results in, in maturation of the dendritic cells, again, by, by, uh, by uh, induction of cytokines. The main cytokine is here interferon alpha. And by this maturation signal, we, the dendritic cells migrate from the, from the marginal zone to the T cell zone and provide extremely strong T cell responses. The, the uh, population producing interferon, or the mechanism behind interferon alpha uh, uh, production is, is uh, mediated by TLS7 uh, recognition, and there are two types of cells involved, plasmocytoid dendritic cells producing early interferon alpha and macrophages producing later stage of interferon alpha. And this results in activation of all cell types, mainly also of T cells. This type of vaccine uh, allows us to get extremely strong T cell responses with just a few vaccinations, allowing us to use this vaccine is really in tumor models with, with large tumors uh, so that we can get rejection of established large tumors. This is an uh, HPV E7 model. But it is also important that even self-antigens can be used in this case for, 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 for successful tumor vaccination. This is CT26 and the self-antigen uh, GP70. And, and the activity of this vaccine strongly depends, strongly depends on interferon alpha because if we block interferon alpha, the activity of the vaccine is gone. We have now this, this systemic vaccine approach in the clinical stage. We started, we started with a dose which is lower than the dose in uh, which, is which were used in mice. So it's seven microgram and, uh, and we increased that to 29 microgram. We see the same type of cytokines in the patients in this uh, low dose. And even with this low dose, which is still lower than the dose in mice, we get strong T cell responses here in case uh, for New York ESO-1 in, uh, in the first patient, and tyrosinase, the immune responses match, match the activity of immune responses against, against, uh, against vir viral antigens. This is cytomegalovirus, EBV, and influenza immune response. This is tyrosinase and New York ESO response generated the vaccine. This is the next patient, so we have treated, treated three patients so far, and, uh, and, and we never have seen such strong T cell responses against, against non-mutated tumor antigens in these uh, this patients, Thereb uh, thereby, thereby really giving hope that this type of vaccines can be used, can be used to translate into highly potent antitumoral activity. So this is the mechanism of the vaccine. We have on the one side antigen expression by disease and type 1 interferon secretion, secretion by, by other cell populations. This results in maturation of dendritic cells and activation of T cells, thereby providing both effector T cells which, which uh, uh, generate strong T cell responses. I would like to thank my collaborators, mainly Sebastian Kreiter, Mustafa Dik and Lena Kranz for, for the RNA wor work and our collaborators in the, in the clinic helping us with, with the clinical studies. Thank you.